Hello, David Zeritsky for the Bond Experience. Welcome back. Well, there are certain hints as to this video. First of all, uh, thumbnail, title, yeah, I know. But beyond that, we've got a um, slightly naked golden girl. We've got a beautiful tuxedo. We've got a Slazenger top. I'm sort of ducked out, but more importantly, we're in the 60th anniversary of Goldfinger, and I can think of no better way than to re-review. I know, we've talked about this, not quite ad nauseum, but a lot, but this is going to be a re-review. Nay, maybe even a dissection of Goldfinger like you've never seen it before. Now, I could do it by myself. That's not half the fun. This is about a community and people, so I'm going to invite one of my very best friends in the Bond community, to come and dissect this with me, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Calvin Dyson. How are you? <laughs> Hello, David. I'm very well, thank you. Here for the dissecting. Uh, looking forward to this. As you say, Goldfinger's always a really interesting one to talk about because it's kind of like, are we, are we just going to sit here for an hour just saying how brilliant everything is? But I think yeah. we're going to really get into the nitty gritty here. No, and, no, uh, no. Yeah. It's, it's 60 minutes of brilliance. That's it. So people can <laughs> dial out. Um, by the way, the die sun section, the die section. The di I, I see a name in the title yeah. coming through. The, I don't know. The it's Dyson something. dissection. Dyson dissection. But then it sounds like we're carving you up. I don't know. Yeah. It sounds a bit like a disease or something that you don't want, really, doesn't it? Mm, the Dyson yeah. dissection. Yeah. Speaking of um, diseased, um, <laughs> I can't wait I did, to know I did, where, 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 where is this segue going? <laughs> I did two things, well, three things really to prepare. Obviously, I watched the movie. That's you know part of our homework assignment. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, I watched two reviews. I watched mm -hmm. your latest ranking review, which you just came out with a few weeks ago. It was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, millions of viewers have seen it. But more importantly, I watched your review and I watched my latest, which actually wasn't a ranking one. It was when I had a, a discussion with Joe Darlington about Goldfinger. I watched those two. So here are some of the things that Calvin Dyson said in his <laughs> oh, ranking. God. Now, you know, my I, words I, against me. <laughs> a little bit, Your Honor. So I, the reason I'm saying this is I always like to create a foundation of where we were in our thinking of Goldfinger over time. You know, has it has it matured? Has it aged like a cheese, like a wine, or like mold? And so here's what you said, that at one time, you felt this was overrated, that it would go off on tangents, that it was an overcomplicated scheme. I mean, my gosh, why are we watching a car getting crushed for all this time? <laughs> but at the end of it, you said it was essential and it wound up in your rankings at number six hmm. and that it did for you a full 180 degrees. And I want to explore that. Now mine, I said it's holy ground, hmm. but for some reason, Goldfinger does not get a lot of my fingerprints. Hmm. But we both said it's unmitigated fun. And it hmm. wound up at number 10 in my latest rankings. Oh, interesting. Reactions to all that. Yeah, j just just in the top 10 is is interesting. Uh, I hadn't gone back and rewatched your ranking to see where this one was. If you'd have yeah. told me to guess, I would have said top five for you. Um, though I, I know that like Thund I, you rank Thunderball higher, right? Like that's... I do. You're a, you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I remember um, you're a big Thunderball fan. And by the uh, way, I did have to go into witness protection program after that <laughs> ranking video. We've moved. We now live in Minnesota. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But these things happen. <laughs> See, I thought I was putting it low, putting it six. It just It's just outside uh, my top five. But it is my favorite Connery, I should oh. say that. And I, I do think that, you know, when, when um, we talk about Bonds, you know, we often talk about, you know, our own personal favorites rather yeah. than sort of objective rankings. I think if, yeah, I did a video on what I, what you know, the Mount Rushmore Bond films recently. Yes. And Goldfinger is like, I, I completely stand by the essential one. I think that it is a very important Bond film. And if you do just kind of want a bit of a flavor of the series just test the waters this one has all of the iconography that you need i think it is sort of like beginner's guide to james bond sort of stuff um but also i do think that this film is in the same category as casablanca lawrence of arabia wizard of oz like pure like 
you know, concrete or gold in this case, you know, cinema classic that, that is just kind of immovable um, after all this time, just the legacy of the film and the influence that it's had and all that. Um, are you on the same page as me? In that regard? Um, nearly. And, okay. and that's, that's one of the things. So, I mean, he, here's what I want to assure everybody five minutes into this discussion. We are going to talk about plot, characters, music, songs, sets, gadgets. We're going to be talking about all that. There's a couple of things I want to impart in this discussion that are a little bit more, um, as you say, iconic. I mean, there are like iconic things. So I want to start with those reviews because I want to talk about the ranking consideration and how Goldfinger, especially in the 60th anniversary year, is regarded. Because to me, I have a question. Is it almost too iconic to be popular with Bond fanatics? And hear me mm -hmm. out. There's Bond fans. Those are people that um, are, are fans of the movie. They watch the movie when they come out. They, they enjoy them. Then they go back to their daily lives. And then there's Bond fanatics, aficionados, whatever compliment you want to throw at it, that their concentration, the backgrounds on their videos, their very <laughs> lives are penetrated. Wow. That was uh, R, mm. um, by James Bond. And because of that, it almost seems like Goldfinger is the one that if somebody at your business or, or you know work would come up to you and say, I've never seen a Bond film before, which one should I start with to really get the flavor and essence? Chances are you would recommend Goldfinger. But to a fanatic, to a a an aficionado, is it almost like going, well, that's the easy one. Of course it is. But <laughs> prove to me that you really appreciate the world of Bond. Goldfinger seems lazy. What do you think of mm. that? I, I think you're kind of spot on with that. And I think that it is a bit of a symptom of when something is so popular, when it sort of transcends. And I think we see this in the Bond series to a similar extent with GoldenEye, I think, is another one. I think Skyfall, uh, where, where they're so popular that they are sort of, for, you know, the general public, I think, kind of touchstone Bond films, which means that when you're in the, you know, the, the cult like we are, um, if they're so overly popular with the normies, as it were, um, <laughs> you know, like you that. sort of you sort of kind of turn your attention to the more, uh, you know, the, 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 the more um, off kilter, I yeah. guess. So you the might avant cite... avant-garde or whatever. Exactly. So you might well cite From Russia With Love rather than Goldfinger yeah. as being, you know, the highlight of Connery's career, you know, things like that. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think, to, you know, it's a victim of its own success in an awful lot of ways. Um, but but it is still, you know, a, a touchstone. I think it is, you know, the, the one that any person looking to dip their toe into Bond should go to first. 100%. And I, I almost feel like not saying Goldfinger in your top five or top 10 or whatever it is, is almost like a strange sign nowadays in the Bond community or the world of Bond fanatics that you've explored a very unique identification to Bond. You've explored outside of it. Like I remember this very clearly, I put Quantum higher <laughs> than Goldfinger and a little bit of it, right. Here we go. A little bit was <laughs> to kind of show the world my identity of where I've explored and who I am versus who people in general, like you say, the normies, think a Bond fan should like. Because every news mm. station that says today in news, James Bond, they use Goldfinger yeah. because that's the one that people go to. Now, let's roll it back because, again, we, we started out right out of the bat with psychology. We're freaking people out. <laughs> You have said, again, I'm not using your own words against you. <laughs> um, you have mentioned about the plot, the scheme, um, even moments of slowness. Joe Darlington said the same exact thing, that mm. there were moments where, my gosh, Bond is incarcerated through a decent amount. In fact, he used a terminology I thought was fascinating, that Bond, this is the Bond Connery film where he's a spectator. Mm. as opposed to an active participant in most of the film. Talk to me about your feelings of the overall plot. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting. Um, Goldfinger's a film that, I, after I've spent enough time away from it, I do sort of uh, find myself sort of taking on some, some of those very common criticisms about the film, which I don't disagree with either, because I think he does spend a load of the film incarcerated. He's not doing all that much for an awful lot of the film. 
Um, it's one. It gets you know compared to Raids of the Lost Ark quite a bit in that sense of like if the hero wasn't there, <laughs> would anything really have changed? Um, you know, we might get into a bit more of that as uh, we we get into talking about the plot. Um, but you know, stuff it goes off on a big tangent for like ten minutes or whatever. We're just watching a car getting crushed that has nothing to do with the plot holes and and all that kind of stuff. So I, I sort of. Um, I, I I feel like I'm more negative about it after I haven't watched it for a while, and then I come to watch it like I did yesterday for for this video, um, and it's like oh actually I don't mind any of that because I am just sort of swept away in the the power of it really. I think that there is something about this film that is really magnetic, um, which, uh, you know, is gold magnetic, actually? I was going to try and make a pun then, but I don't think gold is actually magnetic, is it? We're, we're going to get uh, something in the comments. Probably not, <laughs> I would think, but I'm almost afraid uh, to touch this because of, yeah. Um, no, nothing, <laughs> nothing sticking to my fingers. It's, I don't know where that's going. Um, so, 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 yeah, it, it is one of those where, like, yes, I get a lot of the criticism. Um, I don't even disagree with it, but... When I'm watching the film, I just don't care all that much because I'm just having an absolute blast with it. I think that's where I fall too. So I don't mm. have as maybe many problems as the slowness and the scheme. Part of that, mm. I truly believe, and again, I know it seems like I'm getting into a lot of philosophies here, but uh, part of that is maybe my age. You know, I wasn't brought up in the Fast and Furious or even the video game genre where something needs to be happening all the time. I, mm -hmm. As I get older, even, I, I learn to appreciate the quiet moments of life. So the quiet moments in a Bond film, the exposition, the discussion, the story, the plot, mm -hmm. as it, unre it, it unrolls and reveals itself slowly, I'm actually okay with. What I'm usually not okay with is if it's not surrounded by the fun factor, the visuals, mm. the style, um, the personalities of the characters, good, robust characters. And to your point, the reason I don't have really any issues with the scheme or the plot of what Goldfinger's trying to do or Bond's incarceration of those moments is because it is such a dimensional and colorful film yeah. that when there is those warble moments, everything else buoys me up and, yeah. I, and I rise above kind of this this wave or tsunami of potential boredom like like thunderball mm. and this is mm. going to blow you away here we go 12 minutes in big big reveal <laughs> goldfinger has probably if i ranked my videos today goldfinger would be above thunderball oh i know i know wow. because because thunderball i used to gravitate to because of the lifestyle moment it's going mm. on a vacation bond movie yeah that's not enough for me nowadays I need ah. to have more. Roger. Mo no, I need to have more. <laughs> and because of that, I'm looking now and I'm, I'm attracted to Bond movies that have more of this dimensionality to. And I think Goldfinger hmm. delivers that better than Thunderball. Oh, interesting. Right? Wow. Yeah. This is, this is quite a revelation. <laughs> um, I, I'm so awake. It's like 740 in the morning on a Sunday and... So, so is this your favorite Connery now? Is See, I didn't expect that question. Um, <laughs> you know something? I'm going to have to still say no. Dr. No. Um, no, no. Dr. No is still my favorite. And I'll tell you why. Mm. And you're scratching your head because I know where Dr. No falls for you. Um, it's pure nostalgia. Dr. No mm. has so much heart for me because of Jamaica and my love mm. for Jamaica that mm. it, it blinds me. It, honestly, mm. it blinds me. It's like uh, having a family member that has <laughs> done some terrible thing in life and you sort of just <laughs> like neutralize that because they're your family member. So yeah. Dr. No edges it out. But all right, I have questions for you. Okay. So many. Love um, it. We've, I want to break this down because one of the things we do is, Calvin and I, you've got to understand something about these videos. Uh, we're not doing these videos um, because, oh gosh, we got to get a video done and we got to get content. We truly enjoy doing this. Sometimes we enjoy them so much, I forget certain things to talk about. So I want to start off with the ones I typically forget, which is music. Now ah. we've got John Barry and we've got the Goldfinger song. We've got Shirley Bassey. We've got all these different things. And, and, and the John Barry music starts from the very beginning. But mm. some people have said... We like the John Barry music, but it's uneven. It's not our favorite mm. John Barry music to listen to. 
what did you think of the score itself? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, I'm not, maybe not a huge fan of this one. Uh, it's one of my least listened to Bond soundtracks, and I know that this is heresy, the John Barry aficionados are going to be coming for me now. It's, it, it's too brassy. It, it gets Ooh. a little grating for me after a while. I, I, don't get me wrong, I love the title song. It's one of my go-to karaoke <laughs> songs. Yeah. Uh, I've been known to warble my way through this many a time. But like when it, it, it crashes onto the screen when the title starts, it's like a jump scare moment. It's like the like head coming Miami? out of the boat in Jaws. It's, no, like no, 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 the title song itself. Like... Oh. Um, positively shocking and then bah, da, 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 it's like whoa it's i yeah. I'm, make sure make sure i'm never holding a drink when that happens because otherwise it'd just be going all over the place um i do actually really like that track coincidentally when it goes into miami the uh, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah i love that uh that's so which, really my most listened to track which is, so to give me an example of what's too brassy mm. for you what's what's not connecting what uh during that whole uh, the bit where they're uh, knocking out the guards around Fort Knox, and it's just that bam, boom, oh. bam, boom, like, and all of that, like, in the build-up to all of the, you know, because there are huge stretches of this film where no one's saying anything, and we're just watching, and in bits, like, in sequences like that, I'm just like, oh my god, I just can't can't wait for this music to yeah. be over. Um, so that that's an, that's probably the most uh, prominent example I can think of. Um, what about the yard job? The ding, ding, ding. I, see, I love that. Ding. I really like that. Um, it's such a clever little motif that whenever he's on, you just, you have those dings. It's really nice. Um, no, like I said, there are, there are elements of it that I like. Like, don't get me wrong, I still love this film overall. The music doesn't ruin it for me, but, um, it's a similar way to GoldenEye's soundtrack in a way. Like, there are tracks in that that I don't feel like I'm necessarily, it's, it's in, in a similar space, maybe. Oh God, this is absolute heresy. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Quite the opposite. So, I despise the Goldfinger mm. soundtrack. And I use that word. The, the, the Goldfinger soundtrack. Sorry, the gold Golden Eye. Oh, oh God, soundtrack. right. I was, I was going to say. No, no, no. no <laughs> I, 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 I like, both of us. Right. So I like Goldfinger soundtrack probably more than you do. I don't mind mm. that. Da, 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 because yeah. of the military aspect and what they're showing at the time. I feel mm. like I feel like John Barry in general, what he does very well is he he characterizes his music as a character in the film. So when mm. they're not saying something, uh, his music is the character that you're listening to. You know, it's mm. almost like talking to. So it's it's to me, I think it's appropriate enough. Um, what I love is his treatment of the gold finger music itself, like the mwah, 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 like mm. when they're going through Switzerland and you get this great, yeah. sweeping, beautiful sound. I mean, when you are in Switzerland, if you if you are lucky enough to be in Switzerland driving through the Furka Pass, mm -hmm. that is the music you want to and I have listened to because it is so perfectly sweeping of the curves. It feels like the curves. I, as strange as it sounds, the gold finger, like gold finger by Shirley Bassey, <laughs> I really like it. But I don't mm. tend to play it. And again, it's mm. almost like this. It, it's almost like too popular. And I remember mm. at the uh, 007 Sound of Music, which we both went to, mm. um, when she got on there and sang that, that got the loudest applause. That got oh, yeah. the biggest chills in the audience when she sang that. Because, again, it's this weird thing that I have. If it's overly popular, mm. I almost have to sway a little bit to the left of it. Yeah. You're really going to stand by Moonraker as the best Shirley Bassey uh, <laughs> song. Oh my god, <laughs> that'd be the deep cut. <laughs> I wasn't going to go there. That's that's your field, my friend. <laughs> no, no, I, I know what you mean. Like it is the iconic. It, it's what you know. So many Bond themes that came after tried to emulate. It is yeah. the the big. If if anyone you know is going to you know uh, try to create a sound alike Bond song. It's gonna sound a bit like Goldfinger. There's just, you know, no doubt about it. I yeah. very much agree with you. Like, I do love. I don't want to, you know, shut on the soundtrack too much because there are bits in it that I do really like. And that bit where they are, it is the title song melody as they, you know, is driving through the Swiss Alps. Is it the Alps? Is it the Alps, or is it just uh... the Swiss Alps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, like that's all quite beautiful. I know you love Switzerland. Um, have you, you ever? Well, I've never been. I would love to go. 
Um, Calvin Dyson, you no, live I, in the UK. You are a I, short plane right away. You have no excuse. I know it's terrible. I've I, I, I tell a slight lie. I have been to Geneva Airport en route to Annecy, which is in France. So I've, okay. I've, I've, crossed, I've crossed the border. I'm but, talking uh, mountains. <laughs> yes. No, no. I, 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 I know you love um, that place. Have you ever, like, have you ever, like, rented an Aston while you were over there and done the drive? Like, no. No, I've never rented an Aston. I, I rented a, a Cubo. Which is this yeah. terrible bread truck? I don't know what we were thinking. We were supposed to get a little Fiat, a fast little Fiat, and they didn't have any left. That's a story for another day. Um, <laughs> Calvin, I'm I'm really I, I want to break this down because what mm. I'm trying to do is I want to build up Goldfinger. So I'm kind of starting with music, but we we mm. can't ignore the creative fingers of 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 Guy Hamilton. Mm. Um, Talk to me about this because again, it's one of these discussion points where people love some of the things he's done in the in the world of Bond that he's touched. Some of them don't. What do you think about his directorial um, work here? Uh, I love it. Um, I I absolutely love so much of what he brought to the series with this. You do feel like they're going for the humor much more. The tone is a bit more irreverent than the previous Terence Young films. Not that they, you know, not that Doctor No from Russia would love a dry or gagless. You know, they they do have funny moments, but it is a different tone here. I I think it is more breezy, uh, and I think Connery plays into that really well. Um, and um, I, I think, like, just Guy Hamilton's philosophy coming into the film of just like, okay, we're going to have this pre-title sequence, which is, I think his words were a lovely bit of nonsense. And if you have fun with that and you can roll with that, then great. We're going to have two hours of fun coming up. And I do think he sets his stall out for what the rest of the film is going to be in that pre-title sequence. I think he does it really well. Um I think that his overall legacy in over Bond, I mean, you know, we talked about him the last time we recorded, which was The Diamonds Are Forever, which he also directed. Uh, it, you know, it's a little up and down. I know that he's not necessarily... I don't think he tops many Bond fans' director rankings these days, even though he does have, you know, a couple of very iconic films in Goldfinger and Live and Let Die under his belt. Um, but but I've, I've always been a fan. I, I, I've always gravitated more towards, certainly when I was a kid and I loved The Man with the Golden Gun and Diamonds Are Forever. And, you know, I, his, his tone certainly spoke to me more when I was getting into Bond, I guess. Um, you, you obviously, big Terrence Young fan, if, you know, uh, Thunderball, Dr. No are both quite high ranking for you. So do you see Hamilton's influences as a step back or Not just a... something different? It's it. That's it. It's not, it's yeah. something different. It's, um, you know, I, it's like Peking duck to sirloin. It's like, I love them both, mm. but I, that was the wrong yeah. quote, but, um, <laughs> I, I just, I, I feel with Guy Hamilton. So Terrence Young for me is that more, like you said, serious tone. Um, mm. it, it tells an incredible story and plot. It's a little bit more about intrigue. It's compelling. It's, it's about characters where I can get lost. Guy Hamilton. I know I'm just going to have fun. And I mm. love that about Bond movies now. It's why Goldfinger, like I said to you in the beginning here, has probably climbed up a little bit in my ranking and appreciation list because I need to have fun. In 2024, yeah. in the 60th anniversary, with everything going on in the world, with my age, with just everything going on, I want heroicism, escapism, and fun. Those are the three things. I don't ask for anything else. I used to say, I want Commando Bond, and I want him to wear this clothing. And I'm like, I'm so simple <laughs> as an individual. I just want to have fun now. And I see other movies and other franchises having fun with their characters. And I, mm -hmm. I desperately, and I'm going to say it, I know I, I, I feel like I, I punched this hard, but especially after No Time to Die, I just want to mm -hmm. get back to just the fun factor. You know, I, I don't know if I want my Bond to make a, an Academy Award statement or an indie mm -hmm. film statement or a statement about politics or, you know, affirmations of where we are as a society. I, I just want to have fun. And mm -hmm. Goldfinger and, and, and Guy Hamilton is all about focusing on the audience. He's almost like, dare I say, the Tom Cruise director mm -hmm. type of James Bond films of what Tom Cruise says, I just want to make fun. I just want mm -hmm. my audience to have fun and feel good. And Guy Hamilton, I could see him sitting there directing like, does this make the audience member feel good? Mm. 
I completely agree. I think that's that's probably a big reason why they brought him back after uh, they did the you know the course correction. Obviously, after on Her Majesty's Secret Service didn't connect in the way that they wanted to. Um, but no, I, I, I yeah, I, I have a real soft spot for Guy Hamilton. And again, just some of the things that he brought to the series. I, I'm sure we're going to talk about Q in a bit in the Q scene, and you know how much of the. Q character that we know and love is sort of born here. Like, Desmond Llewellyn is in From a Show Love, Major Boothroyd is in Doctor No, but this is really the first, like, proper Q scene, and a part of that was Guy Hamilton's direction to Desmond Llewellyn, who was, yeah. you know, he said to him, like, you know, um, no, this guy doesn't treat your gadgets with any respect, so you're gonna be a bit, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, he, he he doesn't like what you do, so therefore you you know you don't have the same level of respect for him as you would as anyone else might do. And I think that that's a really key bit of direction. And obviously, it's you know um, stood the test of time. But again, so many elements of this stood the test of time. Like this was the template. It is the template in many ways for what came after. It did. It's really set the trajectory. And part of that is the next discussion point, which is, and I want to get your opinion first as as my guest, <laughs> the look. Of this, and I mean everything from the color to the 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 sets. We've got to talk about Ken Adams. I mean, right mm -hmm. now we're, we're you know put onto a background right now of Fort Knox that like Ken Adams designed. A lot of people don't know that he designed the DB5 and the gadgets mm -hmm. of the DB5. So, talk to me about the look of the film as you experienced it this time. Oh well, it's um. I mean, f first of all, bringing back Ken Adam was just a stroke of genius. I think he is the most iconic of the yeah. Bond production designers. Um, and, and again, just his influence. Obviously, he was on Doctor No. He wasn't on From Rush With Love. Um, but I think you can, you can feel his touch. There is a certain opulence and grandeur. And at this point in the series, their budget's just uh, sort of on the same level of their ambition. So they have the money to spend and build these ridiculous like Fort Knox sets, which looks so cool as yes, this cathedral of gold as i think it was described um so yeah but just right down to like even the the tankers that bond is you know setting to explode at the start of the film you only see inside that room for like a minute if that and again yeah. it just you know the huge curved ceilings and the circles it's just it, it's really um interesting and has its own language i guess Ooh. it's uh it, it, it oh, is just quite a beautiful um look uh i'm gonna this this might be quite nerdy <laughs> well actually, it's definitely nerdy hey look at us but yeah. um the, the fact that the film is, is shot it, it's not like in um uh true widescreen as i would describe you know like thunderball um where right. it's you know if you're watching it on your tv at home now thunderball has you know black bars at the top and bottom goldfinger is a bit more open i th i want to say 185 to 1 aspect ratio someone might well what? have to correct no, me on I that <laughs> I'm, I'm sure someone will know for certain in the comments below but it's in thunderball where they sort of uh you know, give it that, you know, almost cinemascope kind of look. Um, and I do wonder sometimes if Goldfinger is missing that, if that would just help, you know, bring even more opulence to the look of it. Does that ever bother you? Or... You know, I, I've never thought about it like that. And of course, now the next time I watch it, which will probably be in <laughs> theaters, it's going to just distract me. So thank you for that. Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, I, you, that didn't distract me. I'll tell you, there were certain things about the look and maybe even feel of this film that do bother me. And as strange as it is, I, um, I, I first of all, I do like the look. I like, I like the colors. Mm. I like anything that shows that. Mm. But this is a film that uses a lot of back projection. I mean, like the Miami oh, right, thing, yeah. they, they went to Miami, but there's a, there's an opening shot and then that's it. And then it's all back projecting. You can almost see the thing shaking, you know, it's, it's <laughs> like, and then, you know, the outlines of the people and it's, it, it almost looks like a sign of the time. And then just in general, this is not my favorite Bond film when it comes to locations. I mean, showing a Kentucky fried chicken um, in Miami for Kentucky. Um, so the the sets are beautiful. So let me almost separate the two because you did mm. as well. The sets are beautiful. They are iconic. I love looking at them. I love studying them. I've collected Ken Adams, uh, you know, books and things like that. I've made a study of this. When it comes to everything else and how they could have set up the locations, it falls a little bit for me. It really mm -hmm. does. How do you feel about kind of location bond in this case? Uh, you, you do have a good point. It isn't like... 
Thunderbolt, even from Russia with Love and Doctor No, in that same sort of way of like, you see Jamaica, you see Istanbul, you see the Bahamas, and it's like, oh god, yeah, I really want to travel to these places. Switzerland's different, um, but in terms of the Kentucky location, and again, I think a big part of it is because Bond is incarcerated for so much of it, so he is just underneath Goldfinger's um, stud farm, so you don't really see that much of the place other than this one right. farm and then some motorways and, you know, KFC, <laughs> where Felix likes to hang out, apparently. Um, like, I, I don't know if... Maybe... Actually, we didn't even really talk about this that much with Diamonds Are Forever, but as an American, like, I, I don't know if maybe... Because I know you obviously live a long way from Kentucky and Florida. Um, so does do those locations speak to any... Because to me, I see those locations, and I still kind of want to go on holiday. It's like he's hanging around oh, a pool yeah. in Miami. Like I still kind of like the look of that. But yeah. is it kind of less? Um, I guess it would be just less exotic, less exotic. for you. Yeah, yeah. It's... It, it, well, of course. Yeah. You, I mean, you answered the question. It's for mm -hmm. for an American, Vegas, um, California. Um, you know, all those places that that we see mm -hmm. in any of the Bond films, even Vito a Kill, San Francisco. Because I go there so readily and I have been, you know, they're a little less exotic and also they're in your own country. And there is something, there's an exoticism in general about being in somebody else's country, the foreign mm -hmm. aspect, the mystery, the intrigue. The, the, I will say this too, as strange as it sounds, there's a sense, and it's small, of danger when you're in someone mm. else's country. It's like you don't feel as protected. That is a wonderful feeling. It's like watching almost like a scary movie. It's that little like, yeah. oh, I know I'm safe, but it, ooh, it's a little thrilling at the same time. I don't get that thrill mm. when mm. I'm in Miami. I get a thrill when I'm at the Fountain Blue because it's a Bond location. And mm. as a Bond fanatic, it raises my appreciation of this. The fact that the outskirts of the hotel, the inside and pool, totally different. But the outskirts of the hotel, the very shape, the bell, that convex view yeah. of the hotel, if you went there, it is the same. I mean, it yeah. looks like you're transported back to 1964. I think the problem with the locations here is, this is going to sound so strange, but I'm going <laughs> to talk to Calvin. Everybody else can listen and then you just drop. <laughs> I feel like my favorite Bond films, the director is making love to the location. He has such an appreciation for it. Even, dare I say, Quantum, when they show Sienna, that opening shot that appreciates it, you know, the, the look, the feel, the culture. When mm. we see Switzerland here, we see some exposition shots. We mm. see a gas station in Switzerland, mm. a mountain hazy in the background. But I don't feel like he's making love to the locations. Do you know what? That is a really good point that I've never considered about, specifically Guy Hamilton's Bond films before, and I don't know if a part of this is because, you know, we, we, we talked again in, Di in the Diamonds Are Forever um, video about how he likes to make fun of Americans, like, he likes yeah. to sort of, you know, the, the, the very fact that Felix and his CIA um, partner are just hanging out at the KFC drive through yeah. rather than doing anything effective is you know, part of the joke, really. Um, so I don't think he has that kind of love for American locations that we see in those two films. Even when I'm thinking about Thailand in The Man with the Golden Gun, um, Scaramanga's Island is beautifully photographed and all that. But, you right. know, the scenes in Bangkok are a little... Um, Muddy. You know, a little grungy. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, live and Let Die, you know, again, like, you know, New York and, and all that. They're, they're, his, his, the locations in his films do lack that opulence that I think you get in... Um, some of the others, it's less kind of, you know, the Terence Young ones do just invite you on holiday with them, whereas the Guy Hamilton ones, yeah, perhaps less so. That's it. That's it. You said it in a much more professional way than my porn version <laughs> of Making Love. But um, well, speaking of cleaning up our act, um, we've got to. I want to. I want to break down the characters. We're going to do it one mm -hmm. by one, and then we'll bring them together nicely. Uh, and I'm going to be um, an attempt at being chivalrous and a gentleman and ladies first. So I want to talk about. I want to talk about. Pussy galore, right off. I thought you were just going to let me go first. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> this is a weird way of. <laughs> That's a cutting move on my part, <laughs> ladies. Yeah. Um, no, I want to talk about pussy galore. I want to get your opinion because you know when we mm. talk about Bond girls and we talk about their effectiveness, how they fit into the storyline. Are they, are you know, are they somebody that we appreciate? Are they memorable? All those different things. There's a lot to talk about, but. What's the first thing that comes to you when you think pussy galore? I must be dreaming. 
I thought you were just going to leave it at pussy then. then <laughs> you, oh, David, I love so how raunchy things. you are this morning. Yeah, I know. Making love is... of locations just put you in a mood. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, oh, the vapors, the vapors. <laughs> uh, the first thing that I think of when I think of pussy girl is, you know, that iconic shot when, you know, we first see her and she said, my name is pussy girl. Or, like, I... I, I love this character to bits. Like, one of my very favorite Bond girls, I think, that Honor Blackman is just next level brilliant um, in this part. She's gorgeous. She has such a, a confidence. Um, she's, uh, you know, she... she... <laughs> She she was a little older than Connery when they filmed, wasn't she? I think she was a little like only like three or four years, something like that. Um, there is a certain you know she, she she does feel like she kind of owns him in some of those early scenes when he's her prisoner, and um, it, it's a very different dynamic, I think. Certainly for you know the time, this is the third film in, and she is a very different character, I think, than Tatiana and Honey Rider. Um, so yeah, I, I just I can't get enough of her i absolutely adore that character uh, how does she rank for you very high like she's in my yeah. top five bond All girls right, and, yeah. and i'll tell you the primary reason why rather than give you a list because you gave a wonderful list i can't better the number one reason is is that i really feel like she's a part of goldfinger's organization and that mm -hmm. was very unusual in the 60s i mean to have a woman she's a businesswoman you know, yeah. she runs an organization, and I, I know that there's a lot of discussion usually in these discussions of, you know, the, the, the hay scene and things like that. But he's, oh, yeah. she's flipping him around and vice versa. So, mm. you know, the whole taming of the shrew moment, if you, if you take that mm. out of the equation that people always focus on when it comes to this character, mm. I have the most incredible regard for her. I think she's tough as nails. I think she's mm. tough as nails, but is very attractive, meaning you don't have to be the submissive waif, you know, mm -hmm. to be attractive. And I think, and again, maybe this is my age. I find that women are more attractive because of, you know, who they are and what they are in their personalities mm -hmm. because beauty fades. And I'm just, again, mm -hmm. I'm getting very philosophical here, but yeah. she seems like somebody you would want to have a drink with, but also want to be business partners with. Mm. And I love that she's so much a part of his scheme from beginning to end. And even the turning of the moment, the, the, the downfall of Goldfinger, she has a very heavy hand in. I love those aspects. Oh, totally. And I, I do love that she is in this sort of morally gray space. Like, she is involved. She knows that Goldfinger's doing a very bad, illegal thing, but she is going along with it until she eventually sort of realizes that, oh, actually, innocent people are going to die, and, you know, yeah. James Bond sleeps with her, and uh, you know Fiona Volpe makes fun of it in the next film, you know, the woman sleeps with Bond, and then she hears heavenly choirs singing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, which is sort of typified here. It, it is like, uh, you know, I, I think of it as like a Disney Disney moment. It is, you know, it's the prince kisses the princess and then she wakes up. It's, you know, Bond kisses a woman and then he's just so good that it, you know, turns them. Um, I, I see her in a different Disney moment. Not as a Disney right. princess, but more as Boba Fett, which is also a Disney property, oh. in the sense that Boba Fett is this gray and agilist just trying to do a business. Um, but then something happens where they become four people mm. and a little bit more morally focused maybe he just needed a kiss from han solo or something and then he would have totally like you know that's some fan fiction science. right there <laughs> that is some fan fiction people are going to draw that cartoon you can't help oh yeah it. Oh, oh it already exists it, it exists <laughs> it's fine. yeah um <laughs> all right so still staying on the uh the the ladies of this mm. film talk to me about the masterson sisters Oh, yes. Uh, iconic. Well, Jill, you know, Master... It's Master... Is it Master Sun or Master Tun in the film? I can never remember. Because in the book, it's it's Master Sun? So, um, in a discussion I had with Joe Darlington, I mispronounced this thing wrong three times. So it's uh -huh. like Master Sin, Master Tun, Ma Ma Matter Matterhorn. I have <laughs> no idea. It's really bad that I can't remember this. You're it's looking it up, like, aren't you? I, I'm looking it up. Um, <laughs> it's, it's one of those. We'll do it live. Of, 
We'll do it. Yeah, I, I, I know. Uh, this is uh, it, it, it's it's almost like you know, uh, Mr. Winton, Mr. Kid. Even after like you know, nearly thirty years of watching that film, I still, um, you know, I have to I have to say it in my head in their voices to know which ones which. So I have mm -hmm. to hear him say, Mr. Kid. It's, oh, right, it's the other guy, okay. Master. It, right, Master right in the in the film, it's Master Sun. In the book, it's Master Turn. So I was right. Yes. <laughs> and we can end this video right now quick um so what did you think of it? uh yeah i mean for someone who has like what a dozen lines and three minutes of screen time to have that level of iconography is just it, it's next level sort of stuff i mean she is just Shirley and is just iconic in that part in that role um and and her sister's a, a bit of a different um, kettle of fish, really. I know that she's based on, you know, in, in the book, the character is a lesbian and her, you know, she has an infatuation with Pussy Glore because she hangs around in the novel for much longer. She isn't just killed by odd job in that moment. Um, and I, I've always really liked that character. I don't quite know why. Because uh, she, she's, she's very um, short with Bond, but I kind of like that she is a woman on her own mission. And I like that there is that, that Bond is sort of caught up in this web of, like, there are other things going on around him that he might not necessarily be immediately aware of like that. And it does just add this further complication into the story. Um, and I think the actress does really well in the past. Well, I've always really liked the bit where Bond is introducing himself to her and then she just like, no, he, he, he can't even finish because she's yeah. just like pushing by him in that moment. I really like that. Um, yeah, what, what what do you think? I mean, obviously you have her preserved there behind you. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm guessing you're a fan. <laughs> Poor thing. Uh, my fingerprints are everywhere. That's all I have to say. No, uh, <laughs> awful. So two, two, two thoughts that aren't entirely unique to what you just said, but I do like the way they handled both of them because this is very indicative of sisters and brothers that they're different, different personalities. So you've mm. got one that's kind of the brassy, brash, you know, playful one, you know, playing in bed and stuff and, you know, hanging out in a little bikini. And then you've got the other one that's a little bit of the school marm, you know, a little goody two shoes. Mm teacher's pet, you know, type yeah. one. I love the fact that they've got these two very different personalities in the same family. The, the other thought that I can't help but have, and again, I don't know if what it is about my mindset nowadays, but I'm thinking to myself, what a terrible few days this family has had. <laughs> uh, you know, the mother and the father, if they're still yeah. living, the, the, the two funerals, do they have them together? And what's the invite look like? And the, the little brochure, what does it read? Like, you know, I, I just, I don't know. That's all I can think of is like, what an awful day for the Master Tan family. You've got me thinking about like the gold paint, if that has weight to it, because for the Paul is like carrying the coffin, if she's like, you know, weighed down with like... They didn't bury the her. They set her up as a statue for the pigeons in the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they just melted her down. Just hell <laughs> worse. <laughs> yeah, probably. Again, uh, going to be fan fiction now at this point. Yeah, <laughs> cheap Our, gold fillings though. Let's let's move blissfully from this because we've got to talk about and again, toys, pictures, mm. images. Um, ding, ah! ding. That's ding. the factory entertainment one, isn't it? It, it is. I we, love that. We did such a beautiful I job. that. No, but we've got gorgeous, isn't it? to talk about Mr. Oddjob himself. Yes. Talk to me about this henchman of henchmen of henchmen. Um, just a another, like, I, much like Pussy Galore and much like the main man who we're going to be talking about soon, uh, Goldfinger himself, just iconic template. Like, the rest of the series will try to capture that same magic to varying levels of um, success. But yeah, I mean, odd job, Harold Sakata, he's just, he doesn't have any lines <laughs> other than, ha ha. Ah, like, ah, yeah. Ah, ah. yeah. That's basically it. But he just, the way that they've dressed him, he has his own little motif that you mentioned earlier on in the music, which really uh, sort of highlights his appearances in a really lovely way. Um, it just, just iconic. I, I mean that he is just the James Bond henchman. I think you know him. Jaws, uh, the two. You know, Mayday. I would probably put in that similar 
sort of just pure iconic bracket. Um, but yeah, he's brilliant. I I absolutely love him, and the fact that he is so willing to die for his boss's uh, insane plans is such a. It's a. It's a bit of a cliche maybe of you know uh, henchman characters just in cinema more broadly you yeah. know and i don't i don't know if goldfinger was the one to necessarily pioneer that um i would have loved to have seen it at the time perhaps if you weren't expecting him to make that shift and it is because it does kind of play like a bit of a twist when he's stuck in the vault with uh bond and the other guy and he's going to throw him off the the railing rather than have him defuse the bomb and goldfinger's plan fail even if that is going to save odd jobs life uh you, you must love him as well right oh just yeah. adoration absolutely yeah. adoration and i'll tell you what it is a lot of it is of course like you said you know he hits all the icons he set the template i i feel like we're in the 60th year of this movie and 60 years later even jaws i, I love jaws but mm. nobody's really done it better than odd job mm. this this whole absolute laser focus on my boss is god i yeah. mean to him goldfinger is god i will do anything but i'll tell you what it is for odd job yes it's his look and his economy of words all of that but all of that adds up to somebody that is so scary for me. I remember as a mm. child watching this film and being scared of him. I remember two days ago when I saw this film being scared of him. It's mm. it's his power. It's the fact mm. that he can smile. Um, it's this very, very almost like micro adjustments he makes in his body posture. And I really study mm. this nowadays. And then, of course, the fact that he's got this like crazy weaponry here that he dispatches like so many um henchmen don't really use their henchmanness this mm. guy throughout from beginning to end uses it in a big way and i, I just think he sorry he slays it, it is that perfect, uh, you know. Again, and some of the other films try to emulate this. I think they do. I did do. I do think they do it with Jaws to to similar effect because you always like it when the villain's, um, you know, special ability is a part of their downfall as well. Uh, and when it gets caught in the bars and Bond can use it to electrocute him is such a satisfying moment. It reminds me of like you know when he uses the big magnet to pull Jaws up and drop him in the uh, shark tank. It's always just just fun when it, there is that irony of like, oh, you've committed so many terrible things with you know this particular thing and now it's your own downfall it's really satisfying unbelievably so all right we've got to go to sort of a golden moment in this video and that is to talk about the gold man himself auric goldfinger calvin when you take a look at all of the different main baddies throughout mm. the time even with your ranking Number one, let's start with where is Goldfinger himself, the very name of the movie, where does he stack up? He is number one for me, still. Ooh. He is my favorite of all the Bond villains. Yeah, no, absolutely. He is, uh, I did do a, a top 10 ranking video on my channel like years ago now, it must be like six years or something, and it was, uh, go going into that <laughs> ranking, I was sort of like thinking about, who are my favorites? And I was putting them in a rank, and I, I wouldn't have thought going in that Goldfinger would have been my favorite, but just in terms of just how much I just delight in his presence every time he is on screen, I just can't pick a bad scene. I could watch him forever like he is just so brilliant in this part Gert Frobe like an actor that I really like and I do really need to seek out more of his stuff I think other than Chitty Chitty Bang Bang I don't know if I've seen him in much else but he's such a magnetic presence here and just yeah. the combination with the voice as well which isn't even his own voice which blew my mind when I was a kid and I realized that yeah. it's like you know his whole voice is dubbed because he, he couldn't speak English um and Very his real well voice ordered. wasn't that bad. Like, if you hear no. him in real life uh, speaking English, it wasn't horrific. You do hear him in, I think it's in one of the trailers, isn't trailers, it? Wait, yeah. yeah, you hear him say... Uh, I think you've made your point, Goldfinger. Thank you for the demonstration. Choose your next witnesses and carefully, Mr. Bond. It may be your last. But yeah, no, you, you hear him and you're kind of like, oh, okay, well, that doesn't sound too bad. But <laughs> the voice that they did use... Uh, I want to say Michael Collins was the actor, but um, someone in the comments can correct me if I'm wrong with that. Um, but were. again, just pairs up brilliantly. I did watch uh, Goldfinger with, we had a couple of friends over um, last year um, who 
aren't terribly into Bond. They've seen all the Daniel Craig's, a couple of the Pierces, and, you know, we had a night in, so we was like, oh, let's watch a Bond film. Let's watch the most iconic one. Um, and, you know, we chose to watch Goldfinger. Uh, and, again, just their minds were blown at the end of the thing when I was like, you know, that's not even his voice. And he's like, what? Because it just... It, fits so perfectly. It's a bit like Ursula Andres and uh, Nikki Van Der Zyl in Dr. Yeah. No. Where it's just like, no, but it's just so perfect. It just works so wonderfully. I've gone on a complete sidebar there. Um, no, I, but, it's it's a love fest. I get it. <laughs> but but uh, well, I'm, I'm just going to continue that love because <laughs> just I he's funny. He's menacing. Uh, he's such a powerful presence on screen. He can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Connery. Um, it, that whole bit where they're sipping the mint juleps on the porch and he's just delighting in Bond, sort of putting the pieces together in his mind and realizing what Goldfinger's ultimate scheme is. And Goldfinger's sort of relishing that, like, go on, Mr. Bond. He's just, like, really enjoying it. I just, yeah, love it to bits. Yeah, I, 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 I'll describe my appreciation by first starting off since you did. Um, he ranks number two out of all the bound guys. Number one oh is Silva from Skyfall. Oh. I just, I find him so much fun to watch. Every time he's on screen, yeah. everybody else disappears. And that's a testimony huh. to how incredible I think he is. Um, you know, disfigurement aside, I could care less, but, uh, but he ranks number two, which is incredibly high in the scheme mm. of things. But I think a lot of it is, um, and I go back to, again, when I was speaking to Joe Darlington, and I remember Joe saying, I don't like Goldfinger. I was like, what? Mm. And he goes, right. And he goes, I don't like him because he's a schlub. He kind of like you know, rubs his nose and he snorts and he's kind of a slob and he's out of shape and he's not Bond's equal. And I said, that's the reason why I like him. Yeah. Fleming, <laughs> Fleming in the book mm. describes... Most of the bad guys, but certainly Goldfinger as this horrible toady of a guy with a mm. mop of red hair and ruddy, red, overly sunburned skin and just a horrible belly and just all these things. And he's disgusting and he farts. And yes, this is a yeah. funny character come to life, except Gert Frobe puts the life a film into him by having these little subtle moments when, like you're saying, when they're at the stud farm and he's holding the mint julep. And it's just like that little tiny subtle moment is yeah. so rich and colorful that he just, it, sometimes I'll say this, this is a huge compliment. He's bigger than the movie that he's named after. And that's Ooh, Gert yes. Frobe who's doing that. Yeah, I 100% agree. There, is, there are just so many little moments. Like, I, I do think of Goldfinger as just like a film where it, there is just something to delight in in almost every moment. Uh, just little acting things that he does. Even when he's, like, talking the mobsters through his whole plan and he's got his little diorama of Fort Knox and he's using the snooker, um, uh, the pool cue. Yeah. Snooker Q, yes, yes, that God uh, to, to like you know point to things, and it's just, when he's um, by the billiard table and he's just like rolling the balls along. Just uh, you know, it's just moments like that. It's just such small little, seemingly insignificant things, but it just paints a portrait of this sort of playful villainous character that I just yeah. really like. I also really like the moment when they're out on the porch and he tries to touch Pussy's hand, and then she just like pulls it away, and he just has a little moment of like. Okay, well, yeah, <laughs> not, <just> yeah. <laughs> yeah no, exactly. It's like, no, 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 that's an alleyway that's uh, closed off. But um, yeah, no, I, I just, yeah, absolutely. And it's so funny, too, that we're even talking about this in such a dedicated way, because I've always told normies, oh God, I'm going to use that term from now on. Um, <laughs> I've always told normies that the difference between um, a great Bond film and a good Bond film sometimes comes down to the bad guy. And that's mm. why this is a great Bond film. I mean, mm. it really is the bad guy, maybe even more than any other character. Mm. But this is a James Bond film. So we have to talk about James Bond. Oh, do and we have to. We have to, <laughs> of course. So Sean Connery, this is his third James Bond film. Um, I felt that he was extremely comfortable in the role but i think this was the film where we saw you know from rush dr no is his freshman outing so mm -hmm. you know unevenness or steadfast he was creating the template of the character from russia with love hard tack intrigue spy film a little bit more serious does quips well this is where he was able to really imbibe humor and mm -hmm. almost i'm gonna say it this cocksuredness 
the swarminess that we love of Bond today, the, the charismatic charm that says, you son of a bitch, you cocky bastard, you know, <laughs> you, you think you're going to get over, you know, man talk, boom. Um, or, you know, trying to, you know, reaffirm, you know, uh, pussy, you know, all these different things really allowed, I think, Sean Connery as an actor to play in a wide spectrum of who he is and who he could be as mm. Bond. And, and I will say this as Connery too, um, from a style standpoint, Connery was able to be the, the mannequin, not this mannequin, but the style <laughs> mannequin that I don't think anybody else could have done it like him. And I think the reason like mm. things like a three piece suit in, you mm. know, Glenn Glad check like this one has become so iconic is less about the surround sound of the movie and much more mm. about Connery's ability to wear and own style and clothing versus mm. clothing to own him. Ooh, so yeah. that was a long diatribe of Connery. Yeah, that was, but that was great. <laughs> it's almost like rehearsed. But <laughs> What did you think of Connery as Bond in this film? Well, well I, I just want to pick up on what you were saying there about yes. the style, because I did want to, you know, obviously I'm always very keen to get your opinions on these things. Yes, exactly. Because, uh, you know, someone uh, like me who, you know, I, I'm, I'm very much, uh, you know, a, a layman when it comes to tailoring and, you know, suit makers and things like that. This is one of those Bond films where even I am like, oh my God, that is such a fantastic look like that you know the the the, the gray the three piece you know it, it's just iconic and that shot where he's he's it's in the um the alps where he's stood outside the aston martin he's looking down at goldfinger the camera's looking up at him it's just like oh my that's the poster yeah. <laughs> that's just the most iconic i just absolutely love him in that moment but even it's like his golfing gear like what you're wearing now like i look at that and i think like wouldn't mind me one of them jumpers <laughs> it's Oh, amazing. Oh, I love it. Uh, you're going to bring out some clubs now as well. <laughs> so, I would never oh. do that. Oh, <laughs> oh brilliant. Oh, so I I, I've got to tell you that um, when people say to me, and they do from time to time, like, hey, what Bond movie should I start with if I want to create a wardrobe of Bond style? And they think I'm going to go with Daniel Craig. They think that because most of my you know videos and stuff like that are on mm. that aspect. I always say, you would do well, even in 2024, to go to Goldfinger and tell your tailor, for example, I want a suit like this, or I want a hacking mm. jacket like this, or I want my pants to drape like this, or I want a black V-neck with a black polo underneath like this, or you know, look at this, look at what I'm wearing. I'm wearing an NPL polo with an NPL top that has an homage to the world is not enough little emblem. But instead nice. of replicating the the Slazinger look over here, they took the mm. colors and the look of Goldfinger and applied it to an homage. You know you need to have an influential style film for mm. a company like NPL to recreate something like this. So it's yeah. undeniable. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's uh, even down to his like his stealth suit that he's going around in at the start of the thing, and then he pulls it off, obviously, and it's the white tux underneath, just another his iconic onesie? moment. But... His onesie yeah. at the pool? I mean, who else oh, can yeah. pull that off? Like Connery. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're, you're too modest, David. I, I, I've seen your snaps in Jamaica where you're wearing it. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say something else. I've seen your berries and twiggles or <laughs> wedding tackle. Um, would you wear a onesie? in at, at the fountain blue if you had the opportunity uh i mean i definitely couldn't pull it off <laughs> you can i i i would need to uh go you know pick up your exercise regimen a bit more uh, strictly <laughs> i think before i would be uh pulling that off but um uh maybe in private um, okay anyway that's fair enough <laughs> so connery uh, aces for you yeah, that. absolutely. Yeah, no, he's just um, at the peak of his powers here. I think he's fantastic in Thunderball and in From Rush With Love as well. Um, but this is just him at his absolute, just delightful everything that he does. And I completely agree with you on the um, the humor point. I think he is a really good gifted comedian. Uh, and there's bits like that would feel slightly out of place in the previous ones. I think of the bit where he's uh, incarcerated and he's doing that thing where he's just pacing back and forth 
in the cell, and the guard's just there, like, stone-faced outside, and he's just, like, waving, and then he, like, goes down and stuff, and it's just little flourishes like that that are so delightful that he will get out of a potentially dangerous, deadly situation by being so, sort of, frivolous in the moment. I think it's just, it's really just fun. Which is why this is your number one Connery movie, when it comes uh, to Mark, yeah. Right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think he's, again, just peak of his powers here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is it your favorite of his performances? Or do you prefer, like, outside of the film itself? Because I yeah. know, again, you're a big fan of Dr. No from Russia With Love, uh, Thunderball. Like, is, do, do you prefer the Conneries of any of those for any reason? I, I think that Thunderball's presentation of connery may edge it out a little bit just because okay. it's then it's dialed up even more i mean the, the thing yeah. i like about connery and his bond um may be that kind of sarcastic i hate to be like this because i am sarcastic that sarcastic attitude that he gets away with thunderbird right, yeah, yeah. up to an 11 if this is a nine that's an 11 so yeah. it may edge it out a little bit but yeah. calvin i gotta tell you we have to talk about a character and this is going to take everybody by surprise because we're like, well, you got to James Bond. Didn't you just finish your character discussion? But I want to involve Q and Q oh, branch, yes. but I need to put a character together with Q in this because there's another character of the film that I want to talk about. And that is the DB5 car. Oh, I want to talk yes. about this because quite frankly, ah! the, uh, here we go. The uh, little, that's the factory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. By the way, very satisfying. Nice. That, yeah, ASMR. that's music to my ears. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, so the car good. itself, I mean, I, mm. and again, I've sat in this car, driven this car, um, played with this car and the gadgets. But even as a child, I remember buying this car, um, yeah. the toy and having it. And the fantasy of James Bond was filtered through a car who mm. is arguably a character in this film. Now, you, you have it mm. come back in other films, but... Goldfinger was really the debut and the start of all of these different things. So let, let, let's let's bring this together like like the ingredients of a cake. Talk to me about Q, the mm. Q branch scene, and the car. Love the Q branch scene. Again, just going back to what I said earlier on about um, how Guy Hamilton really defined the role of Q moving forward, that he is this sort of like Bond will come into the room and he'll be like, oh God, this guy, because he's just got no respect. He's a playboy with these gadgets that Q works so hard on. And it's, uh, you know, he, he finds it quite disrespectful with such a smart way to play the character. Um, and then the DB5, is it is the ultimate fantasy car really like much like yourself you know like i've got a couple of things here actually that like this danbury mint Ooh. uh is it danbury mint um, yeah the, Dan so, the danbury mint yeah that's yeah. gorgeous uh which is really lovely which has been on my shelf for some time but it's uh you know when you're a bond fan you just sort of end up you realize that you just end up collecting <laughs> just this is one of those little gorgeous. uh dioramas from the yeah. film you just end up collecting the car in its various uh sort of forms um but yeah no it it, it the, the gadgets are insane it's just the most fun oh the so the, no, the solex agitator calvin it's uh what, oh, fuck, what, what what's what's it called again locator um, the, uh... yes yes that's it yeah. yes so this yeah. is this is the one that's magnetic so this oh, is the so thing cool. that's an issue and then this one actually has little effects listen Oh, that's so cool! Ah, is that the Factory Entertainment one as well? Yeah. Oh, cool. And then even even like things like you know his razor, you know having the little thing that oh yes that hides this inside. Yes. It. Yeah. Ah, uh, that's so nice. Ah, uh, love it. So much fun. Yeah, I think I know. The, right, the, the gadgets. It's so funny too because when I was thinking about how do I talk about Q, how do I talk about the car, how do I talk about the Q branch scene, they really do go together very well. I think mm. some movies in the future after this film, it can sometimes be a little force fit. It's like, oh crap, we need to have a gadget or we need to mm. have gadgets. In fact, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but other than this film, I believe that most of the films, what they do is they do the whole film, and then the very last thing is the Q branch scene because they never know mm, quite yes. which ones are going to actually end up in the film. 
Yeah, because they don't know, like, okay, Bond's going to be in a situation, how does he get out of it? Okay, we need to write in the thing that he is going to use to uh, to get out of it. But th in this one, it's kind of, you know, the gadgets sort of, they, they, they feel quite general and unspecific, which I think is a good thing, because there's something, like, the locator, it's kind of like, okay, that just feel like that would be standard issue equipment for agents out in the field, and some of the stuff that the DB5 has as well, like... The rotating license plate never really comes in plot wise. <laughs> it's not like you know, but it's just there and it's just fun yeah. and it's uh, it, it it's because I know there's a bunch of stuff in the car that you you'll know this much better than me where, where they didn't even use them in the film. Um, yes. There's like some uh, trays underneath, I think, with guns in and stuff that I don't think we get to see in the film. Well, um, there's even things like uh, well, there's grenades. There's yes, um, yes. even back then, and there was also there was an, a wonderful exhibit at the Spy Museum in New York City that showed Ken mm -hmm. Adams' drawings, and he originally had a holder to hold champagne and glasses, just like in uh, Goldeneye. Ah, nice. So yes. even back then in the '60s, that was designed. That's cool. Yeah. No, nah, that's awesome. Um, it's a fantasy come true. But what do you think of Desmond yeah. Llewellyn? I love him. He's yeah. so good. He's still a little bit, you know, he little wooden, maybe. If if, if I'm putting on my hypercritical <laughs> do it glasses, uh, and I think he becomes a bit more comfortable in the role as the films, you know, progress from this point on. Uh, but you know, uh, you know, he, he's so withering and iconic in this. I never joke about my work. 007 is such a perfect Q line, uh, iconic even. Yeah, just love it to bits. What, yeah. um, you the same? Oh, yeah. This well, <laughs> I, I, so this will be a testimony, and and I'll keep this brief. I love this scene so much that um, Anthony Sinclair is the tailor that did mm. all the tailoring for Connery in every one of his James Bond films. And when they came to me and said, you know, we want to create a suit for you, the suit that I asked for was not the one from the three piece from the stud farm. It was the one from this Q scene. It was the blue ah, herringbone one. Nice, yeah, yeah. That I wound up wearing, and that's the one that I wore sitting in the DB5 at Aston Martin Works. Of out course, in the yes, yes. That's the one that you you get to see, and I, I love that suit. Still love that suit because it immediately, from a nostalgic standpoint, brings me back to that scene. Yeah, yeah, love it. I just, Oh no! I, I was just going to say, just just a you know a, a yeah. style point, I suppose. I don't know if maybe another reason why I gravitate towards the suits and they like there, there is a bit of a timeless sort of quality to them from my layman perspective uh, in it's the nice. series. When you know when you go into the seventies and okay, those flares are sort of uh, yeah. you know sneaking through and the big collars and stuff, which which is of you know its own thing um, and, and great. But in this one, it is just a little bit more. Like, you know, I just scrolled through the film then. I've just got it up here just to um, look at that suit again and just think like, oh, God, yeah, it is just so damn cool. It it's so damn cool. So but good. even the fit to your point, like this suppression mm. of the waist is is very iconic now. Uh, you walk on the streets of London today and you'll see yeah. a million people wearing it. Um, there's no major flarings of the pants. I will say the pants have this reverse pleat and more multiple mm. pleats now. Usually we have like a flat face on mm. your pants nowadays but the side tabs things like that they still exist the the way the armholes fit they still exist mm. the lapel size is very mm. similar maybe it was even a little bit thinner back then than it is mm. now so um you don't get this like you say we just did diamonds are forever this glaring you know yeah. <laughs> kind of wingman type thing where you could hang glide like roger moore and living like guy <laughs> with those lapels um let's 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 bring this all together because mm. 60 years mm. of Goldfinger, and here's Calvin Dyson and David Zeritsky in 2024 still talking about the film. Back then, in 1964, it started this 1960s marketing juggernaut that mm. made it so people felt very comfortable with the spy genre. It, 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 mm. it spurred and started so many other types of films, and it's such a reckoning today. That's why it's still topical. Even an hour in, people are still watching our video Let's let's talk about this, and rather than a kind of a summation, I wanted to approach this in relation to some of the other Bond films because you and I have used one word very often in this video. I notice, and a lot in our previous reviews, and that is fun. Mm. Three letters, three simple letters, fun, and fun to me equates to 
forgiving. When mm. something is fun in the world of Bond movies, you can be very forgiving of dubbing, of backlit, of characters that aren't as robust, um, as plot lines that maybe go on a little bit too long. But when things aren't fun, let's take moments of Spectre or No Time to Die. Mm. It's a little bit harder to be forgiving. So the fun sometimes wanes. But what do you think about this idea of fun makes us forget some of the, the faults and the warts? Yeah, that, that's a really succinct way of putting it, because I completely agree. And I do think that it is that, that you know, things like No Time to Die, you know, uh, we, we've talked about it in other videos, but when, when you try to sort of get a real genuine, like heartfelt, emotional um, response from an audience, it's, you, you know, it, it, it's harder to do. <laughs> and it's, it's perhaps less forgiving when if you do just have the philosophy that Goldfinger has, which is just, we're just going to have fun, just roll with it. it. You can just overlook things like, why is Goldfinger explaining his plot to all of these mobsters if he's just going to kill them all anyway? Like, it, right. it doesn't make any sense. But who cares? Because everything is delightful in those moments. And, oh, hey, there's a fun scene coming up right now that's great. And it's, you know... Um, so I, I, I do think you can be more forgiving when something's attitude is just to, you know what, we're just going to have a good time with this. Yeah. And I think to, to the point that you made earlier on, I think that's maybe why I'm in a similar place now where I, I do just like to watch a fun Bond film <laughs> and, you know, for, for uh, some, some similar reasons and just like, oh yeah, I, I just like to sit back on a Friday night, just have a blast watching, a yeah. watching a fun old Bond film. It's, um, yeah, it's great. I agree. And, you know, it's interesting, too, because I feel like I'll take, for example, the the Cuba scene in No Time to Die. I feel like mm. everyone I speak to, I don't care if you like the movie or don't like the movie, they, they tend to go back to that one and say, but I really like the Cuba scene, you know, with Anna de Armas. Guilty. I, guilty as well. And, <laughs> and I think a part of that is, is that I'm sure it's filled with all types of bonkerness. It just, you know, mm -hmm. why is this happening and why? And these characters are over the top. But that's the whole point. Like Bond is over the top. Bond is is just to the left, hard to the left or hard to the right of reality. And because of that, we do have fun and escapism. The moment something gets a little too real, like Bond has a kid, you know, Bond's mm. got to pay alimony, Bond's got to <laughs> die, you know, just the reality of things that, that take us out of that and go, whoa, this is, mm. you know, has this become a little bit less fun? And I'm not saying you can't have the more serious moments because from Russia with love is heralded as a very good film, but mm. the fun you have is following the web of intrigue mm. and spy genre in that. So it doesn't have to be nonsensical fun where Jaws is sticking to a magnet. That's a fun. It could be a fun of how does it compel you and mobilize you as, as an audience member throughout the film without mm. the fun factor. Yeah, I'm going to say that things are less forgiving, and that's why mm. we tend to have a raised, arched Roger Moore eyebrow at some <laughs> of these other films that when they're not fun and they have holes in them, mm. we tend to attack. Yeah, no, I, I very much agree. I think I think we are coming back around to on, you know, like how uh, when I was becoming a Bond fan, you know, it was just before the 40th anniversary, and at that point in in Brosnan, th th there was a lot of emphasis on Goldfinger. If it, if there was a Bond movie poll, Goldfinger was going to win it. I remember uh, one of the channels here for the 40th anniversary did a whole the best Bond moments ever thing, and what won was the laser, you know, going up um, yeah. Bond on the slab and all that. Because it's like, yes, of course, it is all of that iconography. Um, during the Craig era, I feel like they sort of pivoted slightly more towards. From Russia with Love to Majesty's Secret Service, uh, for your eyes only, those a bit more kind of like grounded. And um, I suppose a big part of that is because they were kind of more on brand with the Craig era at yeah. that time. Um, so if you're sort of trying to get new people involved and it's like, oh, you like Spectre? Well, you may also <laughs> like From Russia with Love kind yeah. of thing. You can't really do that maybe with Goldfinger. Um, I feel like we are coming back around on that more now, maybe, yeah. and that Goldfinger might, God, I mean, I was going to say have a second life. It's, it's, it must be on its like 12th or 13th or 14th yeah, life. 16, or maybe it's right? just never yeah. died. It's just always um, alive. But um, I, I feel like we are at that 
turning point maybe a bit now and maybe you know maybe our attitudes that we've spoken about sort of the yeah. uh, factor into this as well of just wanting just a fun bond film these days i know I, I, you know fun allows us to celebrate the character and here's mm. how i want to end this video too because uh again we're in the 60th anniversary year we, we're really not entirely sure as of when we're filming this at least uh what eon has planned is it mm. going to be something formal will it be a series of different products you know I, I like we just showed the factory entertainment one i think that's the first one of the year i'm sure there'll be others but calvin how do you intend if you intend at all to celebrate the 60th anniversary of goldfinger I'm going to paint myself entirely in gold, Done. leaving just uh, leaving just uh, a, a bare patch at the back of the spine to allow. <laughs> By the way, you've all it's heard of a mic drop. That's a gold brick drop. That's <laughs> that's he he won. That's perfect. You, you should you should organize something like that, like a big bond community. We all paint ourselves gold. No, I don't think that will ever. Well, that's happening at my uh, gold linger. Um, the uh, the are you going to that? Uh, I, I plan on doing, yeah. It's uh, it's the day before my birthday, I think. Wait, so I really? It's October 13th, right? Or is it 12th? It's October 12th, I think. Okay, or yeah, yeah. I so so, I, I, so I've got I've got two reasons to get absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be at the uh, uh, the hippodrome. hippodrome. Yeah, yes, and, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. It's a whole series of fun stuff, and then I guess uh, what Sunday we have the O2. Uh, arena yes cue the cue music, music stuff like that which will be a goldfinger celebration but and that's your birthday that day uh no my birthday is the 14th so that ah. will be the monday yeah we'll have um, to do and, and, and tr tr well traditionally i like to get out of london for my birthday but i did that last year and i missed out on all the fun so this year i'm kind of like i don't want to miss out on this this year so I, I think i think i will likely be lingering <laughs> yeah, I'm, gold holding linger. you, I'm holding you to it for sure do you think you might um see the film i don't know if you go to the uh the, the film series that they're showing you're gonna show yeah the live? prince charles um yeah. i didn't see goldfinger actually i wasn't here for that sadly um but uh i'm, I'm seeing a few so okay. uh yeah it's nice to have them all on the big screen here again, again it's one of those things that you kind of take for granted because the prince charles cinema in london's so good uh you know every other year it feels they do the whole run through james bond i've gone on a complete tangent here anyway david so no, I, this, is, this, is, this is perfect I, I, I again you know just to kind of follow suit um the thing in london we've got the literally it's called the golden weekend because there's so many gold is the male with the golden mm. gun celebration there's the goldfinger celebration there's the o2 um on top of that i know the swiss are having um a big shindig in switzerland around goldfinger oh, i think cool. they're they're plan on having it at where goldfinger's factory was oh i, cool. I hear rumor <laughs> i thought um, you were gonna say the motorway service station <laughs> that would be amazing i think it's a really important. glamorous meeting i know i know <laughs> petrol please um and then uh i'll be celebrating it um actually next week in washington dc at the opening of the bond in motion which has oh, amazing. Uh, a gold car and a whole bunch of other things so oh, amazing we'll find ways to do it right yeah 100 percent. yeah it's a and little whole year ahead so i know yeah. exactly <laughs> calvin thank you so much i mean we broke this down every way to tuesday um <laughs> i dare say we successfully dissected this film but anything left on the on the uh, laser table so to speak <laughs> i don't think so i think i know i said at the start of this oh, is this is going to be an hour of saying everything's great and maybe it was a little bit but uh wait wait yeah, goldfinger is just one of those films that is just it's magical it it is like a another level of as i said like i put it in cinema classics broadly i think it's a film that transcends the series and i love it quite genuinely uh, for all the reasons that we've talked about and i don't see that diminishing anytime soon it's just it's been a favorite for so many years agreed agreed well my friend thank you as usual i'm always interested we'll see what uh, bond film we talk about next but we had to talk about goldfinger in the 60th yeah, anniversary so thank yeah. you well next one has to be golden gun 50th oh. anniversary so I smell golden themes happening. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this has also been David Zeritsky for The Bond Experience. We will all see you real soon. Take care. See ya. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be 
up on the latest from the Bond experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.